I'm going to talk about uh, something that's that's kept me quite busy in recent months, and it's to think about how in Europe we could try to build, uh, create something slightly different um, uh, in terms of a media initiative, something that would help us uh, connect uh, better, be better informed across our European diversity, and I mean the whole continent, not just EU member states. Um, and I've, I've been given that, giving that a little bit of thought. Two, two words about me. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on a fellowship with the Robert Bosch Academy in Berlin, um, and that's what I'm doing uh, most of this year. Um, I'm, uh, I'm with The Guardian, I'm, a, I'm a, on the editorial board, and I've edited a section on The, on the Guardian called Europe Now, which is now called This is Europe. Uh, check it out. It's good. And, um, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm involved in another project right now, which I'll tell you about a bit later. The first slide you see um, is, is very austere, so I, I didn't want to scare you, but I felt that it was important, even when we talk about culture, uh, and uh, culture lab Europe, right? There's the word lab means that we also have to look at hard data, hard facts, I think also. And so this slide is just to, sit, to just ha make us have in mind that we are now in a binary global world of tech with only the US and only China who dominate the world of tech. And um, if, if I had to say something slightly dramatic, you know, Europe doesn't exist in that world of tech. Uh, Europe is a, is, a, is a territory and a space and its people uh, that is essentially, you know, um, a, a playground for big actors that are from outside. And I'm talking about tech platforms that are outside our realm. And we have to think about that uh, because I think that's unsatisfy unsatisfactory. I'm not the only one to, to say it. But we have to think about that also when we think about uh, a European public sphere and our cultural space in, in all the dimensions of the world culture. So the next, the next slide is um, uh, something that I wanted to ask Menno to kindly, kindly bring up on the, on the screen. Thank you so much, Menno. So this is, this is, this is what scares me right now. So uh, it's called TikTok. And I'm sure if, you have, if you're very, very young, um, and if, or if you have teenage children, uh, you've heard of TikTok. You, maybe you, your people in your family or young people around you use it. Well, this is this is what I mean by the playground. Um, uh, TikTok is run by a Chinese company, a Chinese tech company, and it practices uh, censorship. And it is uh, this has been documented and written about, in particular, by the Guardian. Uh, about six months ago, and TikTok is the fastest growing um, uh, social media uh, short short form video platform at the moment uh, among young people. Uh, it's very dangerous because again, it practices censorship, and very few people pay attention to that. This is this is our European media landscape. Um, of course, I didn't put all the media in it. Uh, just to have that in mind, we are. Uh, in a, in a media landscape that is dominated by, uh, by nation-based uh, media organizations, uh, all of whom are rooted and have a beautiful history, many of them, uh, and they're, you know, many of them are prestigious. They're all rooted in the 20th or the 19th century. Uh, we don't have a uh, strong media that is rooted in the 21st century, and I mean a media that would, you know, come across as, as, as important, dominant, and shared by everybody. Um, uh, there are media organizations that try to reach across. Um, I work for one, uh, The Guardian, but uh, if you look at the, the, the ones that I mentioned uh, on the top of the screen there, they see themselves as global, which doesn't mean they don't have a European dimension, but they are definitely uh, global players. Um, uh, and that's something to keep in mind. The, the, the media organizations that I've jotted down in a bit lower are, yes, uh, uh, European in the way they identify themselves, um, 
But if you look cl more closely, they don't have uh, quite the kind of reach um, and the scale that, that we need, nor in the case uh, of their ownership structures for, I won't go into details right now, nor do, do all of them uh, satisfy um, the notion of a European built, European governed, uh, uh, governed in the sense of who, you know, who's running it, who owns it, uh, organization. Um, the, so just to step back, because I know we're all in the COVID summer. Yes, no, sorry, Mano, this was the good slide. Thank you so much. Uh, this is, this is like, uh, this is, this was my generation. I'm, I'm 54, so I'm, I'm, I'm older than probably most of you, but this is my generation. I, 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 I was awakened to the notion of our common, uh, wide European space, um, in 89 when I was just, uh, still a student but um getting interested in journalism and this this is something we celebrated just uh, you know in november uh, not too long ago it feels like another world now this this uh, anniversary uh, now that we're in covid in the com in the summer of covid um but uh it's it's interesting isn't it that the, the internet uh, was born uh the world wide web was born that same that same year of 1989 the next slide is the the world we're in now uh and, and I think for Europe, okay, the world of big tech giants dominating a lot of what we do, uh, and none of them, none of them are rooted in Europe, and, uh, and our European space, which is fragmented, uh, let's just leave it at that. And I don't think the, the summer of COVID uh, actually helps much um, to overcome that fragmentation. Um, the, next, the next slide is... Uh, just to also, um, I know this doesn't sound all very optimistic, but I'll end on more optimistic notes, don't worry. Um, the next slide is about what I feel, and probably most of you will agree, is, is, is our special European vulnerabil vulnerability. Uh, these, these are screenshots of media that covered the, the Eurozone crisis back in 2010, 2012. Uh, and they're just an example of how uh, our media narratives can get polarized, can feed on stereotypes, on uh, historical hangovers between uh, nations, between uh, cultures. This is our specific European vulnerability in the, in the current media landscape and in current political events. Uh, disinformation, uh, of course, it exists everywhere in the world, but in Europe, because of, our, uh, because of the mosaic that we are of nation states, historical complexities, languages, etc., I think disinformation has a particularly good uh, breeding ground in Europe. Um, 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 and so that this all, next slide as well, please, Menno, this, this all feeds into the thinking that we need to have about um, a, a European public space and an information space that would be renewed. Uh, this is a slide that shows the um, freedom of uh, information that we have also in Europe, um, not a, not a not a good trend, and you'll you'll have noticed that you know uh, in in countries in a in a country like Hungary, but I don't think that uh, media freedom are perfect everywhere in Europe uh, beyond Hungary at all. Um, there are special flashpoints to worry about. Um, this should rekindle our need to build something new in terms of the information space. Um, so this is a little smile. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a trip down nostalgia, or if it's it's a smile, or it's a, it's a half a joke. I put this slide in because some of you, the older ones, will remember perhaps that in the early '90s, somebody called Robert Maxwell, who was a, a, a British uh, media mogul, um, launched the European. It, it exists. It was only on paper. It, there was no internet at the time uh, that anybody used. Um, it was only on paper, and it existed uh, very diffi in difficult circumstances until roughly '98. And uh, it was mostly, it, you, you know, it had, a, for example, it had a section about the weather, so you could see the weather. It had a, a page with giving the weather uh, um, across Europe, not just in your own your own uh, separate country. Um, and uh, this, the, this, this European project collapsed, um, but I'm jumping to today now, and I, I believe that um, because we're in a different world, we have different ways of connecting, and especially we're coming out of this shock of, uh, I mean, I, I was in Paris during the lockdown, and I'm, I'm in Berlin, and I've, so I'm starting to, you know, get a sense of 
trying to get a sense of where we are at in, in Europe today at the human level. And I think there's, a, there's a, a, we can discuss this, I think there's a new sense of togetherness, even as, even as our countries have uh, done a bit of social distancing among themselves, uh, especially at the beginning of the crisis. So I just put that slide in to illustrate uh, in so many ways that you all probably saw on your own screens how there's a new sense of togetherness that is possible, um, but fragile. Uh, uh, this, uh, this, I think I need to check. This slide is, uh, yes, this slide is just to sort of reflect on uh, what notion of, what is the notion of Europe that we should perhaps, you know, uh, have in mind. And my notion of, of Europe, and especially as a, as a journalist, is that it should not be just the EU. Um, I, you know, people who cover EU institutions are doing a great job as when they do quality journalism, and I respect deeply um, journalists who, who do that. But I think that um, if you're going to be looking at Europe as a journalist in, in this decade, the third decade of the 21st century, you absolutely have to look at the continent of Europe. Uh, and in my mind, that's the Council of Europe member countries plus Belarus that was kicked out. So it's a wide space and it's interconnected in many ways. Um, we should not align our purely journalistic vision to uh, just the EU institutions. It's very important. Uh, um, and, and we know, but not just in Europe, that there is a, a trust deficit in, in the media. Um, uh, so many things have been said about this um, uh, in, the, in the debate about populism. Um, uh, so I, I, and this is a challenge that we need to, to embrace in different ways also in Europe uh, to bridge the, the, the gap, the need for better trust in media organizations. Um, the next slide I had <laughs> is, uh, is, is also, to, these are all the, the logos or screenshots from websites of organizations or init media initiatives that have done some great job, great work in terms of trying to break, break bubbles, bring people into, um, to widen the lens and bring people into uh, areas and topics and ideas that they may not, um, you know, spontaneously go to. So I think this is an important challenge as well to, to help that media organizations, a media initiative in Europe should set as a, a major priority to help people see beyond the bubbles or the silos that they find themselves in. And this, these can be social or cultural, national, etc. cetera. Uh, and so uh, why not, even, even as we find ourselves in this traumatic uh, uh, COVID, COVID situation and the, the looming economic crisis that is coming, um, let's perhaps you know, give more thought to this notion, very old notion, right? Going, ba going back centuries of Europe as a, as a network of urban hubs and the spaces between them. It doesn't, it's not a way of negating nation states, not at all. Uh, nation states are part of our diversity and they, they are you know, uh, part of our richness. And, but let's look at Europe as perhaps that, that network of urban hubs and the places between them. It, 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 it opens up all sorts of new dimensions. Um, and so this is the question that, you know, I would, I would, um, I would raise, um, who, who is telling the, who is telling today the, the full uh, human story uh, of, of Europe in this, in this time we find ourselves in with all these uh, debates that crisscross our space, um, and all the challenges we have. Uh, I won't go into all the challenges, you probably know them, but the question is, who is really telling the story? Who's really listening to people across Europe as a media initiative, not, and with a lens that is not nation-centric, that it's not like just one media from one nation trying to reach others. It's a, it's an, it would be an initiative that is built uh, from, the, from the start as something that embraces a wider space, not just one nation and then looking out, but uh, everybody looking across, basically. Um, uh, so there are, there are media initiatives uh, that, that, uh, and media startups that uh, exist and they've been developing and, and growing in recent years. This is something that did not exist in the same way at all 
uh, let's say, you know, 10 or even five years ago. Um, these are just examples, but there's a long list that you can look into. They're all, most, most of the time, they're quite fragile. Um, they're run by young people. Um, and with the difficulties of the media scene, um, they, they need support and they need, uh, they need attention. They need much more attention than they're getting. Um, uh, so I listed a few. And uh, this, this, this is what in bullet, little bullet points about how I, I think that this kind of thinking of uh, uh, cross European or all, in, all European embracing media initiatives, this is what they bring that the legacy traditional media, however quality, however prestigious they may be, but because these legacy media are rooted in essentially in their historical origins, they are rooted in a nation state. Uh, this is what the cross-European, pan-European, uh, embracing Europe, I call them, media initiatives bring. And, um, you know, they, they bring that diverse, uh, the diverse uh, lens and they, they can help connect in different ways. And it's a whole, it's a whole adventure, right, to build one. But they are interesting in that, in that way. Um, so I, uh, I caught COVID in, uh, in, uh, in March and I was ill until April, um, and I did not have a severe case of COVID, but like many people who caught COVID, I, it made me think a lot about what I really wanted to do. Um, and I decided that I would try to reach across and to all the people that I'd met as I was researching Europe's public sphere uh, and its information space, and also people in culture, in uh, you know, uh, people who think about Europe, um, uh, not just journalists uh, who report uh, on events, but people who uh, are on, on the creativity cultural side, um, think tanks, foundations, uh, among them, of course, the, the ECF, um, and so what happened, I'll, I'll, I'll make a long story short, what happened is that in the space of three weeks, uh, 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 an initiative which is essentially carried by very young people uh, in their mid-twenties called the Summer of Solidarity was launched, and it, it launched last weekend. And th these, these few lines that you see on screen are, are probably the core, the core summary of what, what the, what the uh, initiative is about. And I think the I think the key um, the key sentence is uh, solidarity starts with being open and curious about each other. Uh, it's the first thing you need to do, right? Even even before you give anything, you just have to be open and be curious and be ready to listen to the other. So this this initiative, this media and creativity initiative called Summer of Solidarity, is about listening uh, across Europe to people, collecting human stories, sharing them. And doing that for the duration, this is the next slide, for the duration of the, of the, of the summer. So it's really uh, just, it started on the, on the 20th of June, which is in, in this year, the first day of the summer, and it ends on the 20th of, of August. This is what makes it a pop-up, uh, a pop-up media initiative. Pop-up meaning that it only lasts a certain amount of time, and it is collaborative. It brings together a network of small media cultural hubs, uh, citizens' networks. It's, it's a, a mixed, it's diverse in, its, in the way it's built. And this is what it will do. Um, it will uh, do all formats. Uh, uh, and uh, so video, text, etc. a network of journalists will be working, but also people, anybody can contribute um, with photos, videos. Every content is selected by the uh, team of editors, of which I'm a part. And, uh, it, and the idea is to do meaningful, meaningful uh, work uh, that gives a voice to people and that reaches across all the boundaries, social, cultural, geographical, and again, in this wider Europe, not just the EU member states. Uh, this is a slide to show, give you a notion of the, <laughs> of the space and the people. We're going to be looking at people and, and we're going to be looking at places. Um, and that's what the uh, website looks like. Uh, uh, where it's it's still you know it's still if you if you Google Summer of Solidarity you won't hit you won't hit it immediately. But if you Google Summer of Solidarity in one word dot eu you will find it. We're we're working on making it better placed in the Google algorithms. 
Um, so this is what it looks like. It's, it brings um, stories that we, we uh, bring in from the partners. Uh, the partners are, can be small media, uh, startup media that produce beautiful uh, articles, videos, photos that we are interested in and we, get, we showcase them and we name the media, the partner media, of course. Uh, and we will be commissioning uh, our own content. We have a budget for that, Thank you. thanks to uh, philanthropy, uh, foundations, ECF, the Ipocrine Foundation, and the Robert Bosch Foundation. This is uh, the last slide, and it is the, just the beautiful slide of, so far, the network of networks that, that is around, that helps and makes uh, Summer of Solidarity possible. And um, the idea is to continue to grow it. Um, Again, we will have an eye on culture, of course. It's not just about you know, economic, political uh, stories, uh, very much an eye on culture, music, art, everything. So um, wherever you are, uh, come, and, come and reach out uh, and look at the website and join the, the network of networks. I'll stop there and um, I, hope, I hope I wasn't too long and I look forward to the discussion because you're, you're going to help us think about this project as we discuss all these topics. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Natalie, uh, for your presentation. Uh, really, really interesting and inspiring as well. Um, and so while we wait, I guess, you know, people are now s starting to pose questions as we're, as we're uh, maybe giving this short introduction. But I really enjoy, you know, the summer solidarity and I love how you chose the font, you know, kind of reflecting the hippies, you know, 1960s, 1970s. So was this kind of, but it starts from a very, as it was then, from a very difficult cultural moment, you know, the need to change, to, you know, to connect. So is that something, you know, except for the font, but it was that something you were also thinking when you were creating all together this, this project, you know, the necessity in time and space for something to change. Yes, I think there's something to that. I think that's uh, it's clear that the logo, you look at the logo and you feel that you're in the summer of love or something like that, right? But it's, um, yes, there's a, there's a clin d'oeil, you know, a wink. There's a wink at that time of, I would say, time of shifts and changes and questions and struggles and, but, uh, I want to be clear. I, I, I have. I, I don't think at all that we're in the same same world, nor the same. Nor nor does this period of the '60s or '70s repeat itself. Let's you know we are in the, in in 2020 and uh, in the beginning of a decade where we will see probably huge huge changes, and and they they are coming our way in a big way. And I think there is a fragility in our societies in Europe. We shouldn't you know shy. Uh, from that problem, away from that problem. Um, and there's also strength and there's also a degree of resilience and creativity that we can tap into. I think the, the best um, way to look for the answers, because we're all looking for answers, right? And I think we shouldn't be scared of saying, I don't know. In, in this world, everybody always has an opinion and seems to know everything about everything. Well, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be among those who say, I, actually, there's many things I don't know. But uh, we look for the solutions, we look for the answers, and um, we, we can do that by at least uh, making sure we are better aware, making sure we are better aware. And to be better aware, we have to make that effort to look across and find out about others and listen to them. It sounds idealistic, but actually, I think it's I think it's absolutely realistic. It's absolutely realistic because this is how we find the solutions that we need, very concrete solutions. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, this often saying, I don't know, I've been realizing also in my, in my personal and you know, private professional surrounding, this like uh, a fear of a gap, you know, whether it's a knowledge gap, whether it's, we were talking about this yesterday at the lab, you know, sometimes when people are presenting, you know, you don't have to always like fill in the space having a gap is also very valuable. So yes, thank you for that. And so if I can pose you a question, I'm going to read it out. Um, Meno, I'm going to read out, or do you want to uh, pose your question on your own? Well, I'm okay. actually in the panel, so I can just as well do it like this. That's yeah. the kind of privileged position I have. Um, I was wondering, uh, I actually have two questions, but I start with one to 
to give also others the opportunity to talk. But I wanted to know what are for you the main values and the main features, ideally, uh, of how a European public space, European public sphere could, could look like? Um, I think I think that uh, one key thing will be uh, how we think about data. I think it's going to be uh, you know uh, the, the define it it should be and it will, will probably be the defining feature. How do we think about data? How do we articulate a vision where the use of data, uh, uh, the way your data is used, uh, fits with um, some of the fundamental principles of uh, respect for human dignity, freedom, uh, democracy, that these fundamental principles that we have to uphold in Europe and, and that we have to uphold in a world where uh, there aren't that many big players defending these principles today, right? So uh, we're just on the, on the cusp where we know we're in a world that's changing and data is going to be playing an ever bigger role so how data is used, how we approach the building of a European public sphere uh, in, a way, uh, in a way that makes sure that uh, data is not used to oppress the individual, uh, the, the, the freedom and the dignity of the individual. This is, I think this is the core question. Thank you so much, Menno. If you have anything you want to report back, feel free. If not, uh, we will give now uh, for Felipe Gonzalez Gil to pose your question. He's one of us in the organization board for Zemos 98. So, uh, Felipe, maybe we just wait for the technical uh, addition. Here he is. Go ahead, Felipe. Uh, hi. Can you see me? Yes, hi. So thank you so much, Natalie. It has been a wonderful speech, very inspiring. I just want to go to a very concrete uh, thing you mentioned before, because it's true that there are many fair concerns around TikTok regarding privacy, transparency, etc. But it's also important to mention that many TikTokers are, for example, trolling uh, Trump in the United States. Here, for example, in Spain, uh, there is an interesting tendency in which second-generation migrants are using TikTok to uh, uh, share anti-racist messages. So basically what I'm saying is, uh, don't you think that beyond those concerns about TikTok, there are many innovative, innovative and radical narratives happening there led by young people that traditional journalists and mainstream media should have into account? So that's a very good question. Thanks. I mean, really, it's a seriously good question. And my two, my two uh, thoughts on that are um, when I was talking about the way, why I'm worried about TikTok, it's not so much about why, what people are posting on it um, because it's, it's a, clearly it's a very popular, easy to use platform and there are people who are, you know, waging absolutely understandable or admirable uh, struggles and messages and sending out, you know, a positive, constructive content on it. That's not what I had in mind. I had, uh, like, you know, like on any platform, there will be positive, constructive content that brings hope, and there will be absolutely destructive, uh, negative content that brings, you know, despair or hatred. Like on any platform, right? Uh, the problem with TikTok is that it is it is run by a company that that is a Chinese company, and in China, no big company, and this is one of the big Chinese giants now, no big company in China is free from uh, the political control exercised by the regime. This is this is a major difference, and it's the first time that a, a big uh, tech platform from an authoritarian country in this case, China, is spreading globally. This is the first time ever. This is why I think TikTok is a tipping point that we haven't thought about. And we, haven't not, we have been surprised by TikTok, like uh, we've been surprised by many events. We have not anticipated this and, we are, uh, and I'm not faulting any individual who uses it. I'm rather faulting uh, perhaps media organizations who decide to go on it 
without thinking about what that means exactly. Um, so that would be that would be my answer. And to the second, that's my first part of the, of the answer to your great great question. And the second uh, uh, part is uh, something that I I completely agree with you that I think the media organizations um, have not fully been doing their job. Um, and I'm talking about legacy media organizations, and I'm part of them. Okay, so I, as I say this, I'm self-criticizing as somebody who's spent 30 years uh, of a career in a in a in a in legacy media, and I I, uh, I think that we've um, we've not listened to people enough. We have not listened to people enough. Uh, we've been perhaps sometimes too in, too interested in the in the bubble of policymakers or, you know, big players and not being attentive enough to uh, people, uh, to their worries, to their demands, to their needs. And I've, I've seen, I'm not uh, wanting to criticize any specific media. I think it's a general trend and it has probably many explanations, part, mar, among them the, the business model. Uh, of some media, but um, I think that this was visible in in, uh, in many of the shocks that we've seen. Uh, for me, as um, as somebody who uh, who moved to to London in 2014, it was visible in the way Brexit happened. I think there was a deficit of actually listening to really what British society, what some parts of British society were thinking, were feeling. Uh, and uh, there wasn't enough, uh, there was a little bit of complacency that uh, nobody really believed that Brexit could happen because nobody had been listening to people enough in some, in some parts of the population. And this is a severe thing, a severe thing. It's not the own media, media uh, deficiencies or weak weaknesses are not the only reason, of course, for, for something like Brexit. But we have to think about that. And uh, then uh, six months later, what did we have? We had, we had Trump get elected in, in the US. Also, many, many comments have been made about, you know, the, the connection and the way that Trump used the media scene or exploited it and how perhaps some media were not, had not been looking sufficiently at the so-called flyover states and parts of America where... And, you know, again, I, 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 I include myself in the kind of journalists that were not paying enough attention. I, I perfectly include myself. Um, and then I believe that in my country, in France, uh, when the uh, Gilets Jaunes uh, phenomenon started in 2018, uh, we, um, m I, it seems to me, it seems to me that the, uh, the big uh, media organizations in France uh, had not caught on to this early enough. Uh, the, the movement started in the summer on Facebook groups, um, and it became very visible on on roundabouts uh, by uh, by uh, the autumn. But it should have been. This is a problem and an issue that should have been caught 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 and described and uh, looked at very closely um, by media organizations before. So it, all I, you know, I sound like I'm complaining about media organizations. What I'm saying is I, re I recognize my own faults as a journalist. And, um, and this is why I think we need to rethink. And we, think we need to rethink in, in Europe in particular, because I think Europe is very vulnerable as a place where democracy and cohesion and social justice should be uh, defended. So I, I, this is, and I, I find myself in Europe. If I if I'd been, you know, from Asia or uh, other parts of Europe of the world, maybe I would think about my own, you know, the, another part of the world. But I, I, I find myself in Europe, and because of that, then I, I think that uh, this is my message: that this is, and the message that a, a small team uh, around the Summer of Solidarity initiative is is interested in in spreading. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you so much, Felipe, for your great uh, question. So now we have a question from Salma Zulfikar. She's going to uh, talk. She doesn't have a camera, but she will pose the question audio. So Salma, whenever you're ready. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Salma. 
Hi, hi, Natalie. Thank you for your presentation and, um, you know, the information about the project. It's a great project. I'm based in the UK and I work with migrants and refugees to promote um, social cohesion and to stop hate from spreading and to promote empowerment of women. Um, you've obviously been following what's been happening here. It's been absolutely crazy over the past, uh, you know, month or so. And again, you know, with the Black Lives uh, Matters um, campaign as well. Um, you know, at the beginning, we saw a, a lot of positive coverage of migrants and refugees, which was a great relief, you know, because um, we've had so much negative press um, around migrants and refugees because they've been on the front line in, in hospitals working and saving lives. Um, so they've, you know, they've been uh, um, thanked publicly on a high profile platforms in the media. Um, but at the same time now, you know, with, the, with what's happening with the Black Lives Matters, it, it's changing again. Uh, the coverage is changing again, and uh, certainly from my experiences of dealing with some of the media as well, they're just not interested. You know, the focus is is uh, is shifted again, and uh, I wanted to know, you know, what how you think this is going to play out, especially with Brexit on the cards. Uh, something that concerns me in a big way. Thanks for that. You know, I mean, um, first of all, just on a personal level, I want to, you know. Um, say to congratulate you for your for your work in in helping migrants. Um, uh, great thing to do. Um, um, and I would be careful in my answer to you right now because just as I said that um, media and journalists haven't always been very good at getting to the bottom of what's really going on and listening to people deeply and taking the time. I think it's also very hard to predict what's going to happen. You know, it's, it's hard enough to try to see and describe what's going on now, uh, but to predict what can happen is, is even more difficult. And I think um, I, I've, I personally have become very careful about predicting because it's, it's, you know, it's kind of easy to predict. It makes, it gives everybody the impression you have a very strong opinion about something. But um, I, I would probably say, you know, what I think is important to think about and to look at very closely. Um, so for in terms of um, my thoughts on, on the situation, in, I've been fast in the UK and these debates that you're describing, I've been fascinated like others, you know, by how um, uh, the debates in the U.S. resonate extremely strongly in the U.K. and also on continental in the rest of Europe, but particularly in, in the U.K. And it, it, it's been fascinating to watch because for me it shows that there's, it, it kind of amplifies that idea that the U.K. or some of its political and media scene is, has shifted mentally, you know, psychologically towards looking ever more at the at the other side of the Atlantic and perhaps slightly less at, at the rest of Europe. Um, and I think that all of us, all of us on this call and all of us who, you know, I think we share most, all of us on this call share, you know, fundamental principles of, uh, you know, tolerance and co internet cooperation among ourselves and cohesion in Europe. I think we have to um, make sure that all the bridges are kept and nurtured and cherished between uh, British Europeans, uh, anybody in Britain and uh, Europeans who find themselves in other parts of Europe. Uh, you know, this is also the year that Brexit happened. Uh, it happened in January. It feels, it's almost like we forgot it happened, but it's happened. And I think one of the challenges that we have to, our generation and the younger generation has to, um, embrace is how do we rebuild those bridges? How do we make sure that um, indeed we are part of the same uh, European public space? We are. We we must be. Uh, whatever you know, whatever. Despite Brexit, we must be in the same European public space. And that's why when I think of Europe, I don't think now anymore. I don't think only about the European Union. I think about the wider space because Britain is extremely important, like other countries can be, uh, Ukraine is extremely important. Um, uh, many countries are important that are not right now in the, in the European Union. And the European Union, having said all that, 
is something that we must care about and improve and fix and widen. But I, I've, that's, my, that's my thought right now on, on, on Britain uh, and the need to build, those, build more bridges, ever more bridges between uh, Britain and the rest of Europe. Thank you so much, Natalie, and thank you, Salma, for posing your question. Uh, always opens debates in, in different levels. Uh, Menno, I remember you had that second question. So while we wait for others to also uh, come to us with questions, feel free to pose yours. Yeah, it would be great if more people uh, have questions or if you don't want to ask a question but just have an interesting opinion or an, inter an opinion that you think is not interesting, but still it might be interesting, then uh, please uh, share that as well. Uh, I had a question about Summer of Solidarity. It's great, like a pop-up project, and it seems like it's creating waves, a lot of partners, and there's uh, going to be a big... Uh, it's going viral, although in this context is maybe not the best word to use. But I wonder if you have uh, either a strategy or a vision maybe on how to move from a pop-up project to a more sustainable impact on a uh, European public sphere and how this, this can be built in more structurally into the media system. So the first, first what this, this team is doing, and, and it's again, it's a team of uh, young people in their mid-20s, early 30s, across different, different regions of Europe. And the net network of partners is... is particularly diverse and uh, goes all the way across Europe. Um, so this, this is a, an experiment. This is like a first, right? It's never happened. Um, it's a pop-up, collaborative, storytelling, uh, slow journalism, slow in the sense we listen, we take time. Uh, so journalism initiative. Uh, and, and it brings together not just journalists and media, but also as I said, people from civil society, from cultural networks. So it's, a, it's an experiment. Um, and our first uh, priority is to make it work and uh, be, you know, meaningful and give a voice and listen and give, give the impression and give the, uh, create a moment where we really listen to each other across Europe uh, and leveraging quality journalism for that. Uh, so that's the first uh, ambition, and uh, uh, once you once you've succeeded in doing something like that, you have you, I believe you have three things: you have a body of a collection of interesting content. You've documented a summer in Europe in in this year, um, in this in extraordinary year that we are we are going through. Um, and so you have a body that of content, articles, videos, uh, art, perhaps uh, anything you know, uh, uh, photos that uh, that is a testimony, is a witness of this period that we're this unique period that we will remember all our lives. So that's already something. It doesn't disappear, right? You, you, it's something that you have. What you do with it is is a big question, but I think it's interesting to just also think about that. You know, what can you do with something like that? And the second thing you have is that you have know-how. You have a certain know-how. You've learned to create uh, a, a, a network of networks that works together to produce uh, these this content, the videos, the photos, the articles, the thinking. The, the So it's, it's interesting. You have this know-how, a uh, network of networks converging and collaborating for this. Uh, so it's the way it happens that you that is built as you go along. And the third thing you have is you have a community to, you know, for lack of a better word, you have a community of people who anybody who took part in it, anybody who even paid attention to it for like 15 minutes, anybody who supported it, anybody who uh, produced uh, an article or a video or a photo uh, for the many different projects that we have uh, will be will be part of this community, you know, and so that's interesting in itself, you know, who will have joined, and and so um, uh, I think uh, in terms of building the bigger, heavier infrastructure of a proper European platform or proper, you know, permanent European media, that requires another scale of things. Um, uh, but what I'm interested in is is at least the 
the the the the the, the vision uh, the the vision of collecting and paying it, collecting stories and paying attention to people across this wide space and its diversity the know-how that you uh, accumulate by doing this together and the community and the network of people that come together this is these are the three things that i i, I think uh, are interesting to 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 uh, uh, use as a starting point, perhaps for the next step. But I don't have a precise answer to your question, Menno. Thank you Thank so you. much. Precise enough. <laughs> okay, great. So we continue. We got a couple of questions coming up. So I'm going to read one out. It came on Facebook. It says, hello, this is Yesmin. Yesim, writer and director, founder of Galata Perform, and also vice president of Theatre Cooperative from Istanbul. Thank you for great ideas and presentation. I saw some graphics and I think about how Europeans feel about what Europe is and TR was the lowest percentage, if I understood right. Thinking about the Far East of Europe, what do you think about Turkey's involvement in relation to arts and culture of Europe? Do you think maybe we should start seeing beyond borders and talk about the world instead of countries and identity of Europe? even though it seems really impossible to think beyond localities and cultures. Sincerely, Yesim Ozsoy. So just to follow back, when I said TR, I meant Turkey. So, the, you know, mm -hmm. when, um, how do Europeans feel about what Europe is and when Turkey was the lowest percentage? Okay, mm -hmm. so thank you, uh, Yesim and Natalie. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to answer, I, I, I like your question because it's focused on people, right? And uh, I think that um, the reason why, we, why the, the project called Summer Solidarity is focused on human stories is that that way you don't, you don't, um, you, you, you don't uh, get trapped by all the geopolitical discourses or the government state discourses you look at people you look at uh, citizens or people wherever they are in that space that you've described as your european space and again our definition of the european space is the council of europe member states of which turkey is a member there's an organization built in 1949 it's called the council of europe and it includes turkey uh it doesn't it doesn't include belarus for political reasons but we include belarus And I'm saying that because uh, it seems that, of course, you know, the human connections are there. There are, of course, extremely uh, important human connections between people in Turkey and people in Europe. And there are people uh, with of Turkish descent in Europe and there are, you know, uh, Turkish nationals in Europe. So when we look at the, the space of Europe and Europe's public space, it's, it's about anybody who finds himself spending time or living in, in this wide space of Europe in the summer of 2020. That's how uh, we, we've decided to define the, the, the space that we're looking at. And as for culture, well, I mean, you know, culture is, should be absolutely borderless, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, this is, everybody knows that, you know, it's the language, culture is the universal language. So, um, of course, uh, Uh, of course, uh, Turkey and Turkish culture has uh, has a, a place, important place in Europe, and it's in its history and in its identity among the diversity of Europe. Great, thank you so much, yes, and thank you, Natalie. So the next question is from Olga Alekseva or Alekseva. She says, so it's she's just adding on to Menno's question. And so speaking of bubbles, uh, the question is how to make sure that initiatives such as Summer of Solidarity don't end up being preaching to the converted? Mm. That's a very good question. And it's a very good question. And Olga, and, you know, uh, we're thinking hard about that and we need more uh, collective intelligence on that. Um, I think, um, so any, any suggestion, you know, write to us, any suggestion is important. I think one important thing is if we are doing journalism that wants to precisely to break out of bubbles, to reach across, to look more closely at people, listen to them, 
then we really have to do it, right? We have to make sure that the the that the 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 way we do this journalism is diversity driven. And again, when I say diversity, it it, it doesn't just mean the color of your skin. It means the your social background, your cultural background, your geographical location. Diversity should be embraced in all its dimension. Also, in your political background, voices you know must be heard, even if we disagree with them. Listening, listening doesn't mean you agree with everything, but you have to be aware of how some people think and, and you have to engage with them and at least listen to them. Uh, this is the difficulty we have. So um, uh, to answer your question, I think the journalism that is done has to be diversity driven uh, uh, so that it reaches across. Already, if you reach across in your journalism, if you're not just talking only to the policymakers or the people in the capital city or the people who are, you know, already the big players, uh, you pay more attention to the to the grassroots people, that's already uh, a way of making sure you're not just preaching to the choir. And another another answer I would have is that you you leverage networks, you leverage networks of networks. So um, you know the the summer of solidarity should welcome and does welcome uh, also people who you know work with uh, underprivileged. Uh, children somewhere or with you know a, a minority somewhere it's it, this is the strength of this network it's it wants to um, uh, um, embrace and celebrate citizens or citizens networks and civil society organizations precisely to help reach out and go beyond the usual suspects of the the privileged you know globalized or whatever you want to call them hyper-connected uh, um, uh, crowd. So this is that's our strategy. The way we do journalism, and the way we leverage networks and and ask networks to help us reach across. So you maybe you can help us do that. Thank you so much uh, for posing your question, Olga and Natalie, for your response. So next question is for Michael Doby. And so he says, my question is about reframing journalism as a more interactive social process. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if social media is so popular and there is so much interest for people to engage in storytelling, how can traditional media get closer to bridge this gap? For an example, maybe to work with and create apps, nobody buys newspapers anymore, which are sort of an app. So, he, you know, he would kind of like you to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, every, you know, media organizations have been adapting to digital for for like now, you know, almost uh, 25 years, you know, roughly. I mean, some some of them went into digital a bit later, but uh, there's, you know, they, there's been a rush to try to adapt and there's been and there still is a, a crisis of business model. Uh, so it's it's it's, you know, it's it's a shifting, constantly shifting environment. Uh, I'm saying that just to just so that you have in mind that in terms of formats, there's constant experimentation from uh, big media organizations, uh, and and any transformation is is difficult, uh, and the formats require transformation. So, um, uh, you know the what I what what is what is journalism at the end of the day? You know what is it? I think that's probably the question. Because formats can be, you know, absolutely infinite. We don't even know what kind of formats are coming our way. So uh, what is journalism? At the end of the day, what is journalism? And I think it has to do with trust. I think, I think you serve citizens in a, in a democracy or in a place where people want to have rights defended. You serve them um, by informing them and showing them a reality or in a way that they can trust. And this is, this is why we have a trust problem. Uh, and whatever the format, it has to be about trust. That's something that has been, uh, uh, information that has been collected, places that have been described, situations that have been described are provided or offered to the, to the citizens, uh, to the citizen in a way that he can trust, he or she can trust. Uh, and uh, that's not what you find everywhere on social media. You'll agree. So there's a difference between social media and journalism. Thank you. So Michael just uh, commented uh, kind of as a report saying like, yes, but trust only works within small trusted networks. 
So I guess that's, you know, of his concern, I guess, to the whole. That's, I mean, that's, uh, that's an opinion. I would, uh, I, you know, I would, uh, I would apply some journalism to that, to that sentence. So I would like to know, I mean, it's an opinion. I respect the opinion. I think you can build trust in a wider circle. I think it's possible to build trust in a, in a wider circle, but you have to find the way to do it. Great. Thank you so much, Michael, once again. So we have Damien Halley, who posed a really interesting question and comment, and we're trying to see if he maybe wants to uh, address this question verbally. So um, I think he's... Uh, Damien, would you like to, to speak out? Or, oh, he's on a trade. He cannot speak. Okay, no problem. So I'm going to be your voice. So Damien Halley says, Hi, Natalie. Thanks for sharing uh, the three priorities you're seeking. So two comments. First, as you say, the documentation is in a way a form of production of cultural heritage about this special summer. So, uh, yes. And then the second one is network of networks, indeed. Also, I find it wise to see it as an experiment and not dream of a sustainable, existing forever community. Good to create a movement and then see which kind of sustainability remains through connections with other networks and organizations. Uh, do you want to maybe comment on this and then I can post his uh, second comment? I think, uh, I mean, thank you for that because it's, it, you know, send, write, write to Summer of Solidarity, reach out, uh, help us think about this. And I think, you know, your, what, your, what, what, what is contained in your question uh, echoes uh, some of our thinking and some of what we're trying to search for. So please, you know, send ideas help us build the network network of networks further. I think if we grow it further, uh, we build a better chance of making this whole experiment more sustainable, more, more, more long lasting. But, but I, again, I don't have the precise answer right now because we just launched it like three days ago. Great. So I'm just going to continue what he, Damien later on wrote. So he said, brainstorming on some ideas to avoid the bubble effect draft a met met methodological note, including quantitative indicators and targets to ensure diversity along yes. key and a selected number of categories because you cannot embrace all forms of diversity with limited resources in your target audience. So I'd say linguistic diversity and translation is key in brackets beyond English literature, see? And we're already in channels used. And so uh, just a final remark from Damien, who's on a train, uh, fully agree about the uh, centrality of trust. So title mm -hmm. of our culturalsolutions.eu recent report says composting trust. So composition, as uh, Bruno Latour defines it, is also an innovative method. So as you know, Natalie said to Damien, reach out and feel free, uh, mm -hmm. Natalie. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And I, I just wanted to add because... Um, that was in the in the comment that indeed linguistic diversity is part of our diversity. Absolutely, we are having this conversation in English, but uh, we have to uh, include the diversity of uh, our languages across Europe. We we have limited resources in what we are doing for our initiative, but uh, we will be including d d linguistic diversity. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So from Facebook, we have Ange Angela Cardoso. Uh, saying, without culture, we are nothing, but how to preserve and continue to present accessible projects today? How can you help, help us reach it? For, can I ask you to, to sharpen that question? Like, for example, what kind of, what do you mean by accessible projects? Right. So, Angela, please feel free to, um, you know, maybe specify and then Natalie will get back to you. Okay, so, you know, for, again, the second question we have for Facebook, uh, Hannah Rose. Hello, this is Hannah, a socially engaged artist from the UK and Bulgaria collective, uh, Duvar Collective. When there is a call for arts and journalism, including people from diverse backgrounds and socially discriminated against groups, how can we be heard by big organizations such as the European Cultural Foundation when you often do not know the correct buzzwords or ways to write funding applications in the way that are highly trained and not discriminated against artists and journalists, how can the application process be more accessible to such people you hope to engage? 
So I, I, I think um, that's a very important question. I think it's not for me, Hannah. I, I absolutely respect this question. I think, it's, I think it should be picked up by uh, people who, um, you know, um, are on the, uh, on the foundation or philanthropy side. Uh, as, as, a, as a journalist, uh, I can say that, you know, perhaps I can just highlight some of what I said a bit earlier, which is that we have not been sufficiently diversity driven as media organizations. And again, socially, uh, ethnically, identi identity wise, uh, we haven't been driven by diversity as we should have um, uh, been in recent, certainly in recent years. So uh, my little uh, small contribution to finding an answer and doing something constructive alongside the young team at uh, Summer of Solidarity is to say, Come and come and talk to us. Uh, come and join the network of networks, and perhaps we can tell your story or tell some stories that you want to draw attention to. Uh, reach out to us. Um, it's uh, the way to do that is described on the website. Uh, but this is the good time to do it because we will want to listen to you and to your uh, and to people around you uh, and to communities that are not always uh, paid attention to uh, enough. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Natalie. So the next question is from Warren Boucher, um, or Boucher, uh, says, what about diversity of language in Europe? To listen to people's experiences everywhere, you need to pay attention to their language. Is English still seen in Europe as a very important common communication tool? Is there any trend to get away from it? One reason for the amazing reach of Natalie's journalism is her command of English. Mm -hmm. So I believe that um, the, I, I, my, my hunch, and this is a very important and difficult question, my hunch is in two parts. The first part is that um, uh, we must not at all think about homogenizing languages in Europe. The, the fact that we, we can have one language, which is English that we are speaking now, that helps us connect is a chance. And uh, it is a chance that there can be one language that helps connect, not perhaps everybody, but increasingly helps connect. Um, that's important. Uh, um, and uh, that doesn't mean that we should uh, be, you know, uh, trying to negate or diminish the importance and the, and the, the, the richness of, of linguistic diversity in Europe. Um, The second part is that I think that in terms of the media initiative and the world that we find ourselves in, we are right now con 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 connecting through a screen, right? Uh, we're not in the same place, but we're connecting through a, sp through a screen and we do feel together right now. So I think that uh, the, the technology that is coming our way will make the linguistic problem, the linguistic question, much less of an obstacle than it is, it seems to be now. Uh, I think on, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's very likely that in, in a short period of time, we will have absolutely high quality, instant translation of a text, uh, sound and video. This is, this is heading our way, that's for sure. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, it helps understand everybody because indeed there are, there are you know, there are many dimensions to languages, of course. Uh, and, uh, and again, the translations would need to be high quality. Uh, but even so, of course, there are nuances. There are things that have to do with fine, fine sensitivity that, that are part of our diversity, uh, diversity and richness. So my answer to that is that Precisely because we at Summer of Solidarity are a network of networks, we will be working with people who are on the ground, who are in the communities, who, uh, who are able to share the stories, collect the stories, the human stories, with, this, with a sensitivity that helps others understand. It's not about parachute journalism, where you, you fly, you know, 3,000 kilometers, you land somewhere, you don't know anybody, anything or much about the place It, we're doing the opposite. We're doing a locally rooted network of network journalism. That's, again, I'm talking about what I try to know, which is journalism. And I think that's a different way of doing it because when you do that, of course, you're working with people who are very diverse, uh, 
they are diverse in their sensitivity, but also they bring an extra capacity to understand, to understand the other uh, and to know about a bit better about the other. Um, so that, that, that would, be, would be my answer to, to the question of languages and sensitivity. Thank you so much, Natalie. So men would just like to pop in and maybe respond to Hannah Rose, the question that was uh, posed previously about the funding. Yeah, uh, the question seemed uh, to me as uh, directed to ECF, or at least uh, also to ECF, since we are, of course, uh, a funder ourselves. And I think this is this is actually a very big debate within the realm of philanthropy and the foundations that are um, trying to um, uh, to support uh, programs and projects and initiatives, uh, including cultural ones. Um, and I think there are several things uh, what you can do as a foundation. Uh, first of all, I think uh, it's important to pay active attention to diversity in your communication strategy. So it's a, it's a matter of to whom do you reach out. Then the second one has to do with language, like which language do you use to be inclusive? And how do you avoid buzzwords? Uh, that's, um, as you said, like you need to use them, but actually foundations are trying to do their best uh, to avoid them. And sometimes it's also kind of a self-imposed uh, thing from people who apply who think they should use certain words. But actually, I can tell you that as someone who needs to assess applications, sometimes it's much better if they are written in normal language but so that's on one hand but also on the other hand how do we communicate our call uh, for proposals for example and how can we avoid uh, complicated words but also words that do not really speak uh, to certain groups of people so how to be inclusive as possible uh, in your language then there's also some more radical things you can do uh, and these things have to do with like um, democratization of funding so how can you actually it's an interesting question like why do we as staff working for a foundation decide how certain funding whether it's funding of a company lottery lottery funding like in our case sometimes also public funding who are we to decide uh, how this funding is distributed isn't it much better if the let's say the group of people that the foundation is set up for have at least a say in, in the distribution uh, of this funding. Because first of all, they probably know uh, better uh, how to, uh, uh, where the money is best spent, so to say. But also second, it's just like a principal issue that's, uh, yeah, it's a matter of democracy. And in this respect, there there's many, uh, I would say it's now still exper experiments and debates within the philanthropy, uh, philanthropic sector, how to make funding more participatory, uh, which means like there's different levels you can bring in uh, the, the group of people the funding is targeted at uh, in the decision making. So the most simple uh, one is just to have a small panel of people. Let's say you work for, uh, um, uh, let's say, women's rights. So you have uh, a panel of people working for women's organizations and feminist groups that co decide uh, with the foundation or give an advice to the foundation how money is distributed. Uh, but then you can also go more radical and like have a funders, uh, or like a, a funders grantee collaboration, and you could set up a whole structure in which uh, the funder plays more a facilitating role, but the ones who the the ones that represent the groups that the funding is for are actually in charge of the decision making. And that's for grants. And then the, you can even go one step further and bring the whole foundation to the commons, which means it's not just a grant making decision, but the whole governance of the foundation. And I mean, there are some that are going that direction. I can give a very interesting example uh, uh, for uh, the more like the second category to have a structure in which activists and funders are working together 
uh, on distribution of funding and in which the activists in Europe uh, actually have to has the power, and that's called Fund Action. And I uh, I will put it in a check box later. But Fund Action is a structure where uh, activists working on various issues, so it's also also intersectional and interdisciplinary. Uh, come together in a group, they are members and they're part of an online platform and deciding together how funding is distributed. And I think this is also, uh, since the topic is here, European public sphere, like funding is also part of uh, public sphere. And I think these kind of experiments are crucial to have a more inclusive, uh, to have more inclusive debates on funding and more inclusive decision making. I will put a link in the chat box for everyone. Thank you, Mena, for clarifying, clarifying everything and giving some uh, advices and links. So as we come, Natalie has another thing she's running off to, very important. So um, as we don't have any more questions set up for right now, um, if you have anything, Natalie, you'd like to say, uh, feel free to do so. I just wanted to say, you know, I, I wish you all uh, the best possible summer and, uh, and the best possible discussions. And I, I think, uh, you know, we didn't meet in Rijeka. I was planning to go and uh, was looking forward to it, but I'm sure we'll meet in for real in person, as we say, um, in the not too distant future. It would be a pleasure to meet all of you. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you, Natalie. It's a pleasure for us to have you. And I just want to, before we end, invite everybody for our next public event that's going to be uh, streamed. And that's on Friday, 26th of June. So this Friday, at between 4.30 and 6.30, the groups, the participants who are working on the lab will be having a public presentations about their projects and, you know, doing a Q&A on initiatives for solidarity and European uh, public space. So, Natalie, it was a pleasure once again. Thank you, everyone who were who was a part of today's um, keynote, who posed wonderful questions and who opened up dialogues. And all the future luck to everyone. Mm -hmm.